see what it has for us this morning. Good fellowship uh, in God's house. We're very thankful for that. Love each and every one of you and want you to know that and uh, certainly uh, enjoy fellowshipping with you and most importantly, worshiping the Lord uh, together. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn this morning, kind of doing things a little bit uh, un unordinary, I guess, because we normally go to the text right off the bat and read from that. But I, I want to lead into that. But if you'll turn down to Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 27, I'll be there here in just a little bit, but I'm actually going to give you some verses before we even get there, okay? Uh, and you can follow along in your outline. Hopefully I can stay somewhat consistent with that. Uh, and then we'll be uh, to the point to where uh, we need to be once we get down to Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, okay? This week I, I noticed, and I, I try to stay away uh, in large part from news, and I think you understand why, but I did see that there was an actor. I'm not very familiar uh, with this particular person, I guess maybe seeing some movies or something that he had been in. And I, I was reading about his death because, of course, that makes the news when someone that is so-called famous in society passes away. It makes its way around and everyone reads the story about their life and things like that. But anyway, I, for some reason, and I guess it was of the Lord, that I just happened to stop and I said, well, here's a 61-year-old man in Hollywood that died, a relatively young age for death, and I was reading down through his life and it talked about how he was a Hollywood star, lived a life of abuse, drugs, domestic violence, incarceration, homelessness, but at the same time he had reached the pinnacle of what some would say his career. And in the world's eyes, uh, he had the cars, the mansions, the big deal contracts for movies and things like that. But yet his life was torn and battered by sinful conformities. And as I've said this many times, if you play devil's games, you win devil prizes. And so I read about something that he had said in his life towards the end. And he said, I've lived an interesting life, but I can't tell you what I'd give to be the guy who you didn't know anything about. If I could do it all over again, in other words, this famous person said, I would choose not to be famous. I would choose to be normal. I would choose to be a behind-the-scenes kind of guy that when I went to the store, not everyone knew who I was. Well, I thought about that as we was getting ready for this morning's sermon. What in the world does that mean, right? Well, it means this, that this morning we're going to talk about a fellow by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas was not one of the most famous characters in all the Bible. He wasn't, he was a great disciple, an outstanding man of God. And we're going to read about that here in just a second to prove to you just how great that Barnabas was. But if you think about the 66 books of the Bible and I say, give me some of the most um, recognizable names. Well, you might say Abraham. Some might say Moses. Others may go with Noah because of what he did with the building of the ark and uh, then you might go to the disciples, names like Peter, the Apostle Paul, King David, maybe even Solomon. And you would say those are some of the great men of God. And then, of course, you would mention Christ as being the Son of God. But if you think about all those names, maybe even our kids this morning has some recognition, name recognition with them because as they went over into uh, children's church this morning, You'll think you'll, they'll color in the ark and they'll learn about Noah or they'll, the burning bush and Moses. And so they'll, they'll start, but I wonder how many Sunday school lessons have been taught so far in those kids' life about a fellow by the name of Barnabas. Probably not too many. Well, the Bible says this about Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. And Joseph, or Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. He was a Levite and of the country of Cyprus having land. He sold the land and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, where's the timeline? We're in the book of Acts, okay? The Christian church is being formed after the uh, ascension of Christ into heaven. And now uh, we see that the disciples are continuing on the gospel message and the continuing work uh, of the church. And the church is being blessed. Hey, our church is blessed this morning. We've got people in the pews. 
We've got visitors. We've got children. We've got singing. We've got prayer. Uh, the Lord has blessed us this morning, and we ought to be thankful for that. And so the Bible says that the Lord was adding to the church daily as should be saved. They were doing miracles, outstanding miracles. These men of God were uh, given the Spirit of God, and so they were using that to do uh, great healings, preachings, witnessing, prayer, all of the things. And people were being saved and being converted, and we've talked about that some here over the last little bit. Well, let me introduce you to Barnabas. Barnabas was right in the thick of it. He was right in the middle of it. And the Bible says that uh, he got a nickname, so to speak. I've never had a nickname, but I've always been a little envious of those who do. And I don't want you to come up with one for me <laughs> because I'm afraid of what it would be. But some people are known by a nickname and they're really known by nothing else. I know some people and I call them by a name that's not their name. And if you ask me what their real name is, I may not even know. And, and <laughs> it could be that they would prefer that nickname over their mother's name that was given to them. I don't know. Or maybe they've done something a little mischievous along the way and they got a nickname from that act of whatever it was and it stuck. Well, the disciples had given Joseph a, another name that they were going to go by and his name was Barnabas and Barnabas means to us the son of encouragement. Now, the whole sermon this morning is... I want you to go out this week and I want you to keep in the forefront uh, of your mind. At some point this week, I need to be Barnabas. Now, I need to be like Barnabas in some way. To somebody and in some circumstance, God put me in a position to where I can be an encouragement to somebody. Acts chapter 11 and verse 24 says this who, when he came, speaking of Barnabas, he had seen the grace of God and he was glad and he exhorted them all, speaking of the Christians in the church, he encouraged them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say that speaking of Barnabas, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Do you remember what we've said over the last few weeks about your reputation? The Bible says that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. What are people saying about you this morning in the public arena? If someone was going to write an article about you and put it in the paper this week, what would they say about you? You say, I'm afraid to say. What if they really wrote who you are? Would they have to put in there that you are a thief? Would they really have to put in there that you're an adulterer? Would they really have to put in there that you're a drunk? Would they really have to put in there that you're a gambler? Would they really have to put in there that you're a liar? Or that you're a hypocrite? Or can people rightfully say that you are a good man or a good woman? People can say anything they want, but it matters if it's true. I mean, they can say whatever they want to about me, and they pretty much have. <laughs> some of it, though, is not true. And unfortunately, some of it might be. But the Bible says that a good name, what is your name? You say, well, I've not lived a life to where I've got a good name yet. Well, there's no other time like the present than to get started. And if all those things that we just said is true about you, then why don't you change that today? Because the Bible says that Barnabas was a good man. And he wasn't a good man because he cut his neighbor's grass. He wasn't a good man uh, because he done well of his neighbors. He wasn't a good man because he put a lot of money in the offering plate. He wasn't a good man because he never missed a church service. The Bible says he was a good man because he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Remember, we've said this many times, good people go to hell every day. I mean, good people don't always go to heaven. Good people also go to hell. Well, who goes to heaven? People that are full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Somebody asked me this week, said, 
Do you think it's going to, I believe it's going to be hard for all of us to get into heaven. Hard. Well, and I started thinking about that. I think it's going to be hard for all of us to get into heaven. Well, really, the way is simple. The Bible says if we believe in Christ, that you know that we ought to taste of the living water, and if we accept Him as our personal Savior, then we can go to heaven. Well, that's pretty easy, right? I understood what the person was saying. They're talking about in all the temptations of life, it's hard for us to all the time live a life that's pleasing unto God. I get that. I get the temptations. I, I get the laziness sometimes that we have I get all of that but I'm telling you if you're here this morning and you want to be saved you can be saved and there's no reason you shouldn't be saved the time is coming to when what was the song that we sang this morning the wedding music that I hear that we're coming up on the season of weddings people will get married it's a beautiful thing it's an act of God, an institution of God, as marriage is. But there is going to be a wedding that's going to take place one day, and some of us are going to be there, and some of us are not. And I wish that I could walk up to the people that don't want to be there and shake them and say, what do you mean you don't want to be there? You don't want to go to heaven? You don't want to be with Christ? You want to go to hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth that's what you want for your life that's what you want for your children that's what you want for your family that's what you want for your wife and that's what you want for your husband that's what you want no and so today the bible says is the day of salvation well let's get into why you need to be a barnabas well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, 27 that here comes this fellow by the name of Saul and he wants to join the church. Now, Saul wants to join the church. Well, that's a great thing. I wish, that, I wish more people wanted to join the church. We've got a couple of people on slate right now to join the church. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had two fine young ladies join the church. And so if you were to come to me this morning and say, Jody, I've been saved and I've been baptized, but I just don't have a place that I can call home to serve the Lord, to worship with people, a church family. Well, we open the doors to you. I believe every member, I mean, every uh, Christian ought to be a member of a church somewhere. And I know there's a lot of back and forth about that. But my friend, don't listen to people who don't come to church anyway. I mean, if people don't come to church, don't let them talk you out of it. Don't pay them any attention. This is the most one of the most valuable things you'll do all week long. Amen? You say, well, I don't know. It's according to how this sermon goes. Well, let's see. The Bible says that when Saul came to Jerusalem, he essayed and he begged to join himself. Uh, to the disciples or he attempted I guess would be the right word he attempted to join himself to the disciples but they were scared of him and believed not that he was a Christian they didn't believe he was a man of God so here is this person and the Bible says that if you go back to Acts chapter 8 you'll find where that Paul was killing Christians literally he was killing Christians. He was wreaking havoc in the church. And so the news had got around. And by the way, no gossip spreads like church gossip. And it had already got around that there was this man by the name of Saul who was going into the temples. He was going into houses. And if people were worshiping the Lord, he was hauling them to court and they were finding them guilty. And yes, it was actually leading to death. And so the church had shut the door and said, everybody can come in, but if we see this guy named Saul, lock the doors. And so the Bible goes on to say that when Saul knocked at the door of the church, here come all the disciples, and, and they ran from him because they knew what his reputation was. But in to the scene of this Mess comes Barnabas. And he puts his arm around the apostle who Christ had just saved. I mean, he, he was just converted. 
On the road to Damascus, the Bible said he seen a bright light. Christ spoke to him, said, is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? Is it hard for you to go against the will of God? Is it hard for you to run for me? Is it hard for you to neglect me and not serve me? And yet I'm calling you and calling you and calling you and you're not answering. God's doing that to some of you. I see you here every Sunday morning and you're making no move. And I'm wondering if God's not knocking and God's not knocking and God's not knocking and you're not moving. I wonder if God is asking you the same thing. Is it hard for you to live a life knowing God wants you and you don't want him? Amen. And so the Bible says that Barnabas come in and he took Paul. And I don't know if he put his arm around him. I don't know if they locked hands. I don't know if they shook hands. But I almost made to believe that he made him stand right beside of him. And when he stood right beside of him, Barnabas brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. In other words, Barnabas come onto the scene and said, fellows, it's okay, this guy's with me. And the reason that this guy's with me is because this guy's with the Lord. And so now we find where Barnabas comes in and because Barnabas speaks up for Paul, and now he has given him an entrance way into the church and, and now he has given some comfort to these fellows that says he's not here to kill us. He's not here to convict us. He's not here to bring us to jail. He's not here to bring us to the courts so that they can find us guilty for reading the Bible and preaching the word and believing in Christ. That is not his intent. That was who he used to be. I hope that everybody in the church leaves here this morning with a story of who you used to be. Who you used to be, but that you're not any longer. Some of you have told me the story of who you used to be. And boy, it's an interesting one. You've told me the places that you've been, the people you've been with, and what you've done when you were in those places and with the people you were with. And my eyes... We're a little shocked because you've told me that story. And why did you tell me that story? Why would you tell this church that story? Because it's your story of what you used to be. Of what you used to be. And now you can be proud. Why in the world are you proud of that story? You're not proud of that time. You're not proud of that person. But you're proud of the fact that that's who you used to be. And thank God that's who you no longer are. Amen? And so the Bible goes on to say that, of course, Saul would go on to do this great work and be one of the greatest influences in Christianity and the New Testament. We know all of that and do an extraordinary work. But he got introduced to the church and he got introduced to the membership thereof when Barnabas decided, I'll speak up for this guy. Now somebody this week may need you in their corner. Some of some people may need you to stand up for them. They may need you to be their Barnabas. And what in the world does all that mean? Here in a few weeks, if you're a baseball person, and I love baseball. Baseball is not an easy sport to play. And so you have to hit a moving ball and you don't know which direction it's going to go. That's up to the pitcher and you don't know what he's going to throw. They don't tell you. When Sawyer pitches in a game, one of the unique abilities that Sawyer has uh, is that he knows what he's going to throw. He knows where it's going to be, but the hitter does not. Now, he couldn't trick me. I'd take him yard all day long. <laughs> but, but the high schoolers that he's playing with don't know that. And they don't know what he's going to throw. And so they have, to, they have to figure out in a blink of an eye 
what he is throwing and whether or not they need to swing. And when they decide they need to swing, they need to hit it. And you have to catch a moving ball. And you have to be able to run and know when to run. I mean, baseball is not an easy sport. It also wasn't easy several years ago for Jackie Robinson, who was the first black skinned player to play in major leagues. And as he began to make his rounds with the number 42 on the back of his jersey, the crowds were not receptive to the black guy on the field. They didn't think that that was his place. There was a league for people who looked like him. There was a whole league of people who looked like him. Let him go play with them. He has no business here with the white people. And so he would go around from town to town and people just humiliated. Not only from the stands and the fans and the people who were ignorant in the stands, but it also come from the players, not only not on the opposing team, but players on his team. Other coaches would yell at him about the color of his skin and how he didn't deserve to be there. I don't know that why Sarah's waving at me this morning. Am I doing something wrong? And so... I, I, and, and so we look and we see all of these games that he played in and now we're saying go somewhere else, go somewhere else. He went to Cincinnati, to the Cincinnati Reds. And if I were to say how many like the Cincinnati Reds, oh, you'd say that's my team. Well, let me tell you a moment in history that's not so proud for the Cincinnati Reds. As Jackie Robinson made his way onto the playing surface, onto the baseball field in Cincinnati as they were playing against the Reds, the fans in Cincinnati and a large part of them was made up from the people in Kentucky. And you know how us Kentucky people were. It took us a long time to get things figured out when it comes to the skin color. And a lot of us, and I say us, a lot of Kentuckians had crossed the river and were at that game. And here come the criticisms. And here come the racial statements. And here come the slurs during that baseball game with Jackie Robinson making his way onto the field. But then there was Pee Wee Reese. Pee Wee Reese was a white fella. And story has it, and history tells the story, that Pee Wee Reese, during the moment of the game, in the midst of the game, when all of these things and criticisms was being thrown to his guy, his teammate, he goes over and he puts his arm around Jackie Robinson to let the crowd know, this guy's with me. And we would know later on that that would be a monumental occasion to where they've even bronzed it in statue in some places to where it could ever forever be remembered that Pee Wee Reese said this guy's with me there is going to have to be maybe a time that you are chosen to be someone's Barnabas that you are chosen to be in somebody's corner and it's going to be you that's going to have to go out on the limb and stand up for somebody and say, hey, this guy's with me. You may have to do that for your pastor. And I, I pray and, and beg that you, that you choose to be Barnabas rather than stay in the corner and let me remain to get the criticism instead of you coming out and putting your arm around me and saying, this guy's with me. Could very well be that I'm the one that's called on to do that for you and put my arm around you and say, this guy's with me. And it'd be a shame that if I were to stay in the corner and be embarrassed by you. The Bible says that there are benefits to friendship and if you don't have any friends, then you need to quickly find some because the Bible says two are better than one. They have a good reward for their labor. Proverbs chapter 17 said, A friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And 1 John chapter 4 says, And this commandment have we from him that, we loveth, that he who loveth God loveth also his brother. A 
a friend loveth at all times. Good times, a friend still love you. Bad times, a friend will still love you. A friend is somebody that will dance with you when you need to dance, and they'll also cry with you when you need to cry. That's a friend. You've got a lot of people in your life that will dance with you. You've got few people in your life that will cry with you. Amen? You've got a lot of people in the life that will spend your money. You've got few people in your life that will give you money. Amen? John chapter 8 is another story. How did, how did Barnabas learn how to be Barnabas? Well, Barnabas did not set for us the primary example of how to be a Barnabas. What Barnabas did was he, he set forth how to be Christ-like. When he put his arm around the apostle Paul and said, this guy is with me, forget about his past, that's not who he is anymore. Forget about where he used to go and what he used to do, that's not who he is anymore. He put his arm around him and said, this is a new guy, I have seen him, he's a Christian just like us, and he's one of us. You know who also done that? In John chapter 8, there was a woman, the Bible says, caught in the very act of adultery. Here she come. They brought, it, they brought her in into the presence of Christ. They brought her, the Bible says, the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought the woman taken in adultery when they set her in the midst. And they, and they said, Master, calling upon Jesus. They didn't care about this woman. They, they, they didn't care about her. They didn't care about the adultery. They didn't care about any of that. What they were trying to do was entrap Jesus in a way to where they could say he was guilty of something. So they used her as a ploy to do that. And they said this. They said, Moses' law, or in Moses' law, we are commanded that if someone be taken in the act of adultery, like this woman, that she ought to be stoned. And they said, what do you think, Master? And they were waiting for Christ to say one of two things. If Christ said stone her, then they would say, see, he's not for mercy. He preaches mercy, but he's not for mercy. He wants this woman to be stoned. And they would call him a liar. But at the end, if Christ said don't stone her, then they would say Christ is not for the law of Moses. And he's a blasphemer. They thought they had him. They thought they'd entrapped him. Christ had no way out. But what they didn't know is that Christ was going to say something that was going to put them in the corner with no way out. And the Bible says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself in verse 7 and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Now things drastically change. There was a momentum shift. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the oldest until the youngest. So that now, in the presence of this story, the only two people that were there was Christ and this adulterous woman. Because all the accusers were guilty, and so they had to leave. No one was worthy to throw a stone. No one was worthy to cast a rock. And when they heard it, they began to walk out. Now it's just Jesus and this woman. And Jesus looked at this woman after he lifted himself up and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. You say, what was the greatest moment in this woman's life, this moment? I don't know what all that this lady had done before, and I don't know what all she went to do after, but I know this, the greatest day of her life was this day. The greatest words that she heard were these words. The greatest person she ever met was Christ. And all the life that she lived, this was her moment when Christ looked at her and said, I don't condemn you either. 
go and sin no more. A lot of people say, well, that's the reason why I can do what I want to. God is merciful and God will forgive me and God doesn't require of me. That's not what this story is about. The Bible says a lot of people wants to just leave it that Christ said, neither do I condemn thee, which frees us to go out and do whatever we want to. Live an unholy life. Don't worry about it. God will forgive you. Go out. Spend your night in the bar. Don't worry about it. God will forgive you. Go out here and lay drunk. All. Don't worry about it. God will forgive you. Oh, he will. But what he requires of you is to stop. Amen? Go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you don't know that, I've read that verse to you a hundred thousand times in the five years I've been here. That he that is in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. If you stole, you steal no more. If you lie, you lie no more. Amen? Amen. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You know what Jesus done that day? He put his arm around that woman who nobody wanted to have anything to do with except the men who knew what they were getting. But Jesus put his arm around that adulterous woman and said, she's with me. Now that took a whole lot for the Son of God to put his arm around a woman who was taken in the very act of adultery. It also took the heart of Christ to be at the well when the woman who had five husbands and was shacked up with another man come to draw water and Jesus changed her life forever. He put his arm around her and changed her life and she went into the city and said, come and see a man which told me everything that I've ever done. Zacchaeus got his, he got the arm of Jesus put around him when he said, I'm going home with you today. And Jesus said, this day of salvation come to this house. The day that Paul was on the road to Damascus was the day that Jesus said, from this point on, you'll be on the winning team. You'll be on my team. Christ is wanting to put his arm around you this morning and say, I want you to be with me. Leave it all behind and come and be with me. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. How do we bring all this together? We have 30 seconds left. I'll tell you how we bring all this together. Is that this week, my friend, somebody is going to have a bad day. Somebody is going to receive bad news. Somebody that you're with is not going to be blessed that day like you are. And that's an opportunity for you to be an encouragement. That's the opportunity for you to be somebody that you didn't even know anything about until you come to church this Sunday. And now we're talking about somebody named Barnabas. Every time I typed Barnabas yesterday in my notes, in Word, it put that little squiggly line underneath it. You know what that means? It means you're a dummy. Because you didn't spell it right. And every time I went to spell Barnabas, every single time, I spelled it B-U-S at the end instead of B-A-S. And I could not get it right. Why? Because I've not wrote that name as much as I've wrote some of those other ones. I know how to spell Paul. Well, you say a monkey knows how to spell Paul. But I messed it up every time. So you're going to say, what am I going to do this week? I'm going to go out and I'm going to be somebody that I didn't even know was in the Bible. And his name is Barnabas. And you're going to go out and you're going to be the Pee Wee Reese to Jackie Robinson. You're going to be Jesus to the woman in adultery. You're going to be Barnabas to a fellow by the name of Saul who he put his arm around and said, it's okay, church. This guy's with me. Somebody will need you this week. Somebody will need you in the days to come. And I pray that God instills it in us, that he has put us in a position to be a friend to somebody who needs a friend. Stand with us this morning all over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity to make